Okay, it is 10 past 11, and we are ready for our next session. Uh, this is going to be presented by Madeline Ruggiero, and it is using interactive tutorials and digital technology to teach students how to read a scientific study article. Madeline Ruggiero is an assistant professor and collection development librarian at Queensborough Community College. Madeline teaches information literacy classes and is the liaison to the psychology and art history departments. In addition to an MLS, Madeline also holds a master's degree in art history from SUNY Stony Brook. Uh, just a quick reminder that these sessions are being recorded and the recordings will be shared afterwards. And uh, there will be 10, 20 minutes of presentation and then 10 minutes of questions. And I will uh, butt in around 20 minutes just to uh, let you know. So uh, with that, uh, feel free to take it away. Okay. Just Hi, good morning. I'm just sharing my screen here. So um, I teach information literacy classes to psychology students, and they often have a hard time finding and reading a scientific article because that's often what they're required to do. And I've given, I've also um, created tutorials uh, using screencasting. So I've created video tutorials and I found that they weren't very useful because they, I mean, it was better than nothing, but they didn't interact the students. So I wanted something where the student could interact and engage. And so I searched for an interactive tutorials. So then what am I, what do I mean by an interactive tutorial? Um, an interactive tutorial, gives the ability of a student to do tasks, answer questions, or receive feedback during the course of a tutorial, um, as opposed to the screencast tutorial where students are often passive and just watching. And research has proven that using tutorials to teach online is the most useful strategy for remote learning. Now, I'm, I'm proposing the use of the interactive tutorial to enhance library instruction and not to replace it. So as an asynchronous means and also as a, as a way of um, doing a flipped classroom, so to speak. So the interactive tutorial requires students to engage with the content. <clears throat> Excuse me, students work at their own pace and can navigate back and forth between the sections as needed. Each module includes videos and text and requires students to interact with or view the videos and content before moving on to the next module. Immediate formative assessment requiring students to learn, practice, and receive feedback via quizzes is available in an, inter in an interactive tutorial. The best practices for tutorial design um, as per the research states that technology, you can have technology up updates, maintenance and revision is available, cognitive learning and chunking is made available through the interactive tutorial, the ability to skip sections or move ahead for more learner control is made, made available to the learner, ensuring ongoing engagement with the tutorial, integrating learning management system with the online tutorial, and um, <clears throat> LibWizard ticks all these boxes. So using the SpringShare LibWizard full tutorial platform, tutorials are easy to build and are user-friendly. SpringShare offers a robust support team with regular updates. Um, there was another interactive tutorial that was free. It was Guide on the Side that was put out by the University of Arizona, but they stopped offering support. So some people then went to LibWizard or were searching for another platform and, and LibWizard is that platform that will fulfill that because they both had split screens. The next is information is provided in bite-sized chunks. Now the motivation behind LibWizard is the idea of offering bite-sized small learning units with just enough information to help learners achieve a specific goal. Brain, the brain learns better when the content is delivered in small bursts and LibWizard does this. 
The split screen layout includes space for instructions and a variety of question types on the left side, while allowing students to interact with content on the right side for active learning. You're also able to create various types of interactions and activities, such as drag and drop, multiple choice, fill in the blank. You can easily embed in a, in a learning management system if you're on Blackboard or a Canvas. Liz, LibWizard reporting features allow librarians to analyze and visualize data to evaluate student learning and tutorial effectiveness. Now, LibWizard does have some limitations and the first being that it's not free, unlike Guide on the Side, which was free. Um, a LibWizard tutorial must be completed in one sitting. There's no way to save the tutorial progress. So you just have to let students know about this. No option for collaboration or co-editing a tutorial and they don't offer closed captioning It's not provided, but they do offer a template where they show what accessibilities are offered. And I've put links in at the end of the slides into what LibWizard offers. Uh, let's move on to the next. And these are the links that I've provided you with and two, I've also provided you with two LibWizard samples aside from mine, which we're going to go into. And these are my references. And now I will shift to, a, to the LibWizard tutorial that I created for my psychology class in teaching them how to read a scholarly article. So now when you're here, in the, when you have the LibWizard, the way you know that you have LibWizard full is you'll see the quizzes and the tutorials. Now LibWizard Lite comes with, um, with your LibGuides and that only offers forms and surveys, but you'll know you'll have the full if you, if you have the quizzes and the tutorials. The full is $700 if you have the Lib if you have the LibGuides. I don't know how much it is if you don't subscribe to LibGuides. I'm not sure if it's, if it's more if you don't subscribe. Okay, so now I'll show you my tutorial that I created and the tutorial was easy to create. So this is the first page and um, I state up here that it's what, the, what it's designed for and how long the tutorial will take. And then I, I make sure I tell them that this tutorial must be completed in one sitting because they can't save their progress. So if they walk away and the computer turns off, then you know, all, all of what they've done will be lost. And then I tell them that a certificate of completion will be given at the end. And this will begin the tutorial. I tape myself giving, a, you know, welcoming the students and telling them what to expect out of the tutorial. And then I ask them a question, you know, how, do, how are they feeling about creating the, about look of uh, viewing the tutorial and then the next slide um so it's a split screen so the students can interact with um with the with what you present here on the right hand side and then you give them directions on the left hand side and here i'm just showing them how to find a, how to limit uh an article in a psychology database to to uh, an empirical study so that they're sure to get a scientific study article. And then let's move on to the next. And here I actually show them an example of a study article so that they can see what it looks like so that they'll be all, so that all the components of the study article are present in the article that comes up. And with those limiters that I, that I showed them how to do, an article like this should come up. And then let's move on to the next one. And then I, you can embed videos, which is nice. Uh, and it's very easy to do. It's not very difficult. If you've created LibGuides, you'll recognize how to, how to do this as well. Um, and this is a short a short video uh, explaining the components of a scientific article. So whereas when I created the video with the screencast, which was just a video tutorial, it was like a five minute tutorial and I went through each component and they weren't able to interact the way they can here. And I'll show you in a minute. Um, I can, you can embed uh, quiz questions, right? And so they answer these, these questions and then 
they move on. Let's see, I'll just, I'll show you how this works. And if the questions are wrong, it'll tell you that one's wrong and it won't allow you to move on to the next slide. So now I want to show you the back end of this, of how this is created. Just a moment, I have to, yeah. Just a minute, sorry. Um, uh, okay, so, all right. So if we go to, get rid of that. If you go to tutorials, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Now it is, um, well, the back end is not, it's not very, it's not difficult to create these at all. I had a back end up here to show you how to do it, but you can all, you can always just click through the links that I provided in the slides and they'll, you know, they, they walk you through it, how to create this, how to create the tutorial. But I found it's, it's very effective because like I said, students can engage and they, they engage with it before class and then they come to class and you add on to their knowledge and, part, and adding on to the knowledge includes this um, using the hypothesis. Well, actually, let me just show you. So hypothesis, it's, a, it's free. It's a social reading um, annotation tool. And um, the annotation process allows for highlighting, uh, jotting down notes, you can make symbols, sketches, questions. Um, and the design structure is asynchronous with social reading and open annotation of a web-based test, or it's synchronous virtual discussion groups, individual written reflections can be made. So now why use social annotation? It helps students engage with shared text. Students can be virtually on the same page and annotate. Viewing peer comments can create a shared feeling that others are struggling to grasp the material. So students may feel, oh, you know, this is really hard. I don't get it. Well, they may read their peers' com uh, comments and they're saying the same thing. So they see they're not the only one. Get a glimpse of students' practice, supports reading comprehension and memory allows students to work remotely and collaboratively on the same project, useful for granular modes of reading and can delve more deeply into shared text. And this is perfect for explaining a scientific study article. You can go over the different components of the study article and choose. So for example, in the introduction, you can state um, what is specific to an, to an introduction and highlight the sentences that show you that. Um, it's just, uh, it includes more student voices in a large class. You can also include hyperlinks to other documents. You can highlight important points and perplexing areas. And it's used by students to ask questions, express opinions, make inferences, and create summaries. And you can promotes interaction with peers. So it's a catalyst for discussions because often when we're doing online teaching or online learning, the learner is feeling isolated. So this is a way of engaging students and bringing them, bringing them together so that they can interact with each other. So it's free and it's an open source. And so you would create an account to annotate the text and um, you can see the comments in the sidebar and I'll show you in a moment. And then it works with anything on the web. Now, if, if you're trying to work on an article that you found in a database, you would just download the PDF form of, of the article and then save it. And then from there, from your saved document, you would put your um, hypothesis and work from it that way. And I'll show you in a moment what I've done here. So after they've looked at, at the tutorial, uh, the LibWizard tutorial on how to, how to find and read a scientific study article, I have them come in. I, I work with them on their, um, on their document. And, and then I show them, we, 
download the, um, the hypothesis together and they create an account. And this is the little icon, hypothesis icon that you'll see um, so that you'll know that an account has been created. So if I were to say I wanted to explain um, the introduction and what you would find in the introduction section of a scientific article. And so if I were to highlight this section here, and then students can, we can have a public, um, a public annotation and comments can be made and students can engage that way and I can make it public up there. So it's been very useful for students and, and I feel that they've, they, um, they're, engaged, they're more engaged and they're asking more questions through this method and also they're participating and they can write notes and it's also good for the, for the presenter or for the instructor because they can see how their students are thinking, what their thought process is. Um, and that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you uh, very much for that. That was that was really uh, fantastic. Uh, I think there are quite a few questions in the Q and A. If you want to uh, head over to that, yeah. and you can just pick and choose uh, as you'd like uh, and answer the ones you'd like to answer okay. there. And if that's anyone good. has any questions, feel free to uh, throw them in there because we uh, we have a little bit of time. Um, so someone asks, how do you get by? buy-in from faculty members for adding a flipped classroom with interactive tutorial for library research instruction. Sure, um, so it's, it's a collaboration, right? So I, I have to actually, I have to collaborate with them. And most of them, well, actually all of them that I've worked with, they're happy to do this because they want, they want to give the students a head start and they know that the students are struggling. And so I tell them, to have the students view the video and then they get a certificate at the end as an incentive and they're not graded on the quizzes. So, and, but they do part, they participate with me. There's been no problem on that. So as the, the assessment, it's a formative assessment. I guess it could be a summative one if the professors want to grade it, but it, the assessments are formative. So students, I guess, feel less apprehensive. Um, when you say no captioning, does does that include if you embed a video from YouTube that already has captioning? You know, that's a good question and I'm not sure, but if you go to, in my slides, I've included the link to the template that Springshare offers on, on accessibility because they do have accessibility for screen readers. I'm going to guess no, that it does not include the YouTube captioning. Uh, I know they have captioning captions for um, images. So, but there are, there, there are links in my slides that you can go to to have that question answered. Uh, I love that it's a flipped type of classroom. Yeah, I think a flipped classroom helps because then you can just build upon, upon their knowledge. Was this embedded in Blackboard by using, sorry, was this embedded in Blackboard by using the LibWizard link or some other way? Uh, I did. I did not embed it in Blackboard. Um, I just gave them the link, and that's how they did it. But you can embed it in Blackboard because it does work with an MLS. Does the embedded tutorial allow QCC professors to track if the student completed? Yes, the tutorial and their quiz results. Yes, it does. It gives you a feature, and that's related in the that's um, available in the quiz section. At NCC, we have created something similar, but professors wanted to embed it within their courses and track the student quiz results. Yes, and you can embed it within your course and track the quiz results. You can do that with LibWizard. Does each student need to create a free account in Hypothesis? Yes, they do. They need to create an account before they can actually use it. Regarding LibWizard, have you encountered any issues related to accessibility? No, um, only the closed captioning. That's, that's about it. In Hypothesis, does the article need to be native PDF or can a digitized print article be used on the design? Uh, 
Does it need to be a native PDF? Well, it, it recognizes websites. And like I said, in if you're getting a, an article from a database, you download the PDF and you save the PDF, and then you can use it that way. The design arts have possibilities that aren't in databases. Okay. Um, did you did you record all videos or were you able to utilize some open educational resources and videos? Oh no, I didn't record all videos, not at all. No, I embedded some the two videos that were on there were embedded from um, from YouTube on how to about the components of a, of a scientific study article and also um, the most efficient way to read a scientific study article. Those were embedded. And like I said, it's LibWizard is very easy to use. I mean, if you're using LibGuides, you're going to be able to use LibWizard. I am concerned about privacy when asking students to do this. Um, concerned about privacy. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I haven't come across that, so I can't really respond to that. Hi, could you remind us of the name of the annotated tool used? It's it's called Hypothesis, and I have the slides, and I'm sure you'll you'll be able to have the slides. Um, I'm providing you with slides. Uh, yes, those will be shared. Yeah. How difficult is it to walk the student through the sign up for Hypothesis or DUS? No, it's not difficult at all. And I also shared I shared a link to a YouTube walkthrough, so it's pretty easy. Uh, do you have students? Do you have students who do not do the pre-class lib wizard material? No, I haven't had students because no, because it, they're required to do it by their by their professors, and um, it just hasn't happened. Where are the where are the slides available? I don't know. I'm not sure about that, where the slides are. I mean, I guess the slides will be available at the end of the at the end of the conference, correct? When we when we upload the uh, videos and uh, the slides will be uploaded then too, and so all all registrants will receive uh, an email with that information. Yeah, because I did have a extensive reference list that I used for the um, LibWizard, and you should also know that I <laughs> I've I I did a grant proposal for LibWizard, so that's how I got into all the um, the psychological benefits of it. Um, is setting a time limit to tutorial optional? Yeah, it is optional, and but I think it's best to set a, a time limit so that students know how long it's going to take because they don't usually like to sit through like 30, 40 minutes, right? So this way they know. Um, I am, uh, just a moment. Uh, what was the name of the option to spring share that was free? Oh no, there's no option to spring share that's free. What I was saying that there's a spring share, it's called, uh, it's Wizard Light, and Wizard Light comes with your um, LibGuide subscription. So, and Light doesn't allow you to create tutorials or quizzes. It only allows you to create forms or surveys, but that's not free. It comes with LibGuides. Uh, do you share your tutorials publicly as our LibGuides? Do you share? I don't know what that means really. Um, I know that you, you can put your LibGuides on LibWizard and it's a nice way to each, also you can make quizzes about your LibGuides. Um, do, do reviews also provide tutorials? I'm not sure about that. Do faculty gather student participation information from you? Or is it on an honor system in terms of their participation? No, they would gather the information from me because I would have access to who participated. Slide links again, you'll get access to that. Are there, um, are there any security issues with the Hypothesis software? Also, how do you deal with copyright for the article you use? Is it in a subscribed database? Hmm. I don't. Uh, I don't know about any security issues. As far as copyright, that's a good question. I never thought about that. I, yeah, haven't thought about that. So I don't really know. Okay, 
could you show? Okay, but some students have different abilities. It takes longer for them to absorb material. Does the tutorial shut off after the limit? Oh no, the tutorial does not shut off after the limit. And I'm glad you mentioned the different abilities because I think in, in my proposal for, in my grant proposal, I talked about LibWizard and the fact that it ticks all the boxes as for, UD, for UDL, Universal Design um, Learning, because it allows students to work at their own pace. You're including um, a variety of material. So you're including video, you can include video and images, and it caters to students um, learning a different, different, with different learning abilities, and different learning levels. And I think it's um, UDL compliant. So it definitely takes into account all the different um, student learning abilities. That's what I like about, about it. And also that it's, it's chunking, which is, it, you know, it, it, it gives you information in, in small bites. And that's, um, that's good for students with different learning abilities. That's what I like about it. Great, also PPT points. Okay, any other questions? No, you're welcome. So I recommend, I highly recommend using LibWizard because I know there were some people who were using side on a uh, guide on the side. And then when the University of Arizona stopped supporting that, they looked for something else to, you know, to to substitute that, and LibWizard has a robust, um, a robust. Uh, they support the um, the the product, so they have blogs, they have seminars where they they teach you how to use LibWizard, and um, they have a group also where you can ask questions and answers, and also Spring Share. They're always they're always um, responding when you have a question. So it's, I think Spring Share is the way to go as far as for LibWizard, if you can afford it. I mean, $700 is not a lot, but now that all these budget cuts are happening, it can be a lot of money. And I'm not sure if you, if you get, um, if you get a, if it's more money, if you don't subscribe to the LibGuides, but I know if you subscribe to, Lib, to LibGuides, it's an extra $700. And I think it's, it's the way to go. Thank you. Any other questions? I saw that some people were might have been posting questions in the chat rather than the Q and A. So if if oh. if that was you, you don't you don't have to go in there. But if if you if any attendee did post any questions in the chat that they would like to see answered, that maybe um got got missed, uh, post that in in the Q and A because we still have about three minutes left. Madeline, there was a quick request to share your reference list. If you could do that, please. My reference list, okay. From your PowerPoint. From my PowerPoint, okay. For the for the Lib Wizard one, right? So there it is. Thank you. Yeah, these are all the articles I read when I was uh, actually writing that grant proposal. <laughs> um. And I tell you, having made um, video tutorials and LibWizard, LibWizard is much easier to use than screencasting tutorials. Screencasting, you have to um, you know, edit and it takes time to write the script. How long did it take for you to get comfortable with using this option? It's easy to edit. Yeah, it's very easy to edit, especially if, if you're familiar with LibGuides because it's the same system. And um, I was going to show you the back end of it, but somehow that disappeared. Uh, but it is—it's easy to edit. It didn't take long at all because they offer—they offer tutorials on how to actually do it that take you step by step by step through the process. So I felt very comfortable. Whereas the video tutorials were a little more tricky to use. Did the students like using Hypothesis versus Google Docs? Yeah, I'm not sure. I didn't ask them about Google Docs, but. Um, they, they were pretty open to hypothesis. Uh, so I think LibWizard is a great product and I would 
highly recommend it. And uh, for someone who doesn't have a lot of technical background, I was able to put a video together. I mean, if, if you're using LibGuides, it's not going, you know, it's not going to be much of a shock to switch over to LibWizard because it's a, it's a similar format. And I think it's 1140. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I learned a lot. It generated a lot of uh, discussion in the chat. So uh, thank you. Thanks. Great job.